Hi everyone, welcome uh, to this webinar. I'm Lolly. I'm a content writer on professional beauty and today is World AIDS Day. So we are joined by Sam Marshall, aka the beauty guru, who does a lot of work on uh, inclusivity for uh, transgender people, people living with HIV and how you can make sure that your salon is welcoming towards them. We've also got uh, Paul Fairweather, who is the positive speaker manager at George House Trust and Paul actually also played a part in um, opening in the trust in 1985 and we also have Agatha joining us today who is a positive speaker um, who's going to share her story and talk to us a bit about what it's like um, living with HIV. So I'm going to pass over to Paul who's just going to do a bit of an intro into um, what George House Trust is and what they do. So over to you Paul. Thanks so much, Lolly. That's great to be here. Um, I say I manage the Positive Speakers Project at George House Trust, and I've been involved in working around HIV since the early 1980s, and since the beginning of the epidemic. I'll talk a little bit about what George House Trust does. We provide a lot of support to people when they're newly diagnosed, because when you first know you're living with HIV, it can be a huge shock. I was diagnosed in 2000, so I've been living with HIV for 22 years. When I was first diagnosed, I took about 12 tablets a day, lots of different tablets. And now I take one tablet a day, I see my consultant every six months and my health and my life expectancy is fine. But there's still a lot of discrimination and prejudice and ignorance around HIV and AIDS. So hopefully that's what we're going to um, talk about today. So we provide a lot of support to people when they're newly diagnosed, a lot of one-to-one -one support, but also a lot of support um, in the group. We have particular groups for women, for uh, African people, for young people. We've got a group for over 50s and we've got a peer mentoring project, which is people living with HIV, supporting other people. We also do a lot of work in terms of training and education. The Positive Speakers Project I manage, I work with a great group of volunteers. And we do a lot of work in schools, we had funding in Manage here, taught to a whole year group about HIV and AIDS, what it is, how you catch it, how you can't catch it, but also talk about our own experiences of living with the virus. Um, a little bit about HIV for people. Like HIV is a really difficult virus to catch. It dies really easily outside the body. The only way it's transmitted is through mother to baby. And in this country, every woman who's pregnant will be offered an HIV test and if she's pregnant be given some medication. So it's quite rare for uh, children to be born living with AIDS these days. The main way it's contracted is through unprotected sex. So that's whether that's heterosexual sex or gay sex. So we encourage people to use a condom which protects you from HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. And it can also be transmitted through uh, sharing needles if you're an injecting drug user. Mark, one of my speakers is a heterosexual guy who became infected when he was sharing a needle. So again, that's less common now. So there've been massive changes, both in terms of the medication and in terms of social attitudes. So there's still a bit of ignorance for HIV and AIDS, the difference between HIV and AIDS. I'm HIV positive, which means I have the human immunodeficiency virus in my body. Um, if I stop taking the tablet I take, over time, the virus will increase and I would have a definition of AIDS which isn't one disease, but it's a whole series of different syndrome of diseases you can get. So in the past, in the 1980s, I saw friends of mine who were young, young men in their twenties who were fit and healthy, developed HIV, there was no treatments, they developed AIDS, so they died of a mixture of diseases, pneumonia, they wasted away. So again, that's very rare these days. Um, when I was first diagnosed, what's called my viral load, which happened how much of the virus was in my body, 750,000. So I had lots of virus in the body. I was very infectious. I've probably been living with HIV for quite a long time. Um, I'm now what's called undetectable. So it's now under 50. So there's a tiny, tiny amount of the virus in my body. And if I stopped taking the tablet, I say that would grow over time and I would actually uh, go on to develop AIDS and probably die. <clears throat> but that's now called U equals U undetectable equals untransmittable. So it's been proven beyond any doubt that for people like me who are undetectable, we cannot transmit the virus. So if my blood went directly into your blood, you'd be completely safe. 
And for those just living with HIV, that's a really important thing because it eliminates the stigma and discrimination that people fear might have. So we're quite keen to get that message across to anybody. 95% of people in this country are undetectable. So people are scared about contracting HIV. We're the safest people you can meet. You might meet someone who says they're HIV negative, but they've never had an HIV test. They don't know their status. They might be living with the virus. Or you might meet someone who says that they're negative, they've had a test, but that might have been a year ago. So we really encourage people who think they might possibly be at risk of contracting HIV to have a regular test. And there's also PrEP, which is if you think you're at risk of HIV, you can go to a sexual health clinic, get an antiretroviral tablet, and that will prevent you from becoming infected. So the combination of you, because you're in PrEP, certainly in Manchester here, Andy Burnham is here in Manchester, has made a very public commitment to eradicate all new cases of HIV by 2030. So although it's not a cure, there's not a vaccine, it's very possible that within a generation, HIV will disappear as a disease because there's no people transmitting it. So that's really positive message in terms of HIV and prevention. Yeah. Um, I, I'll I call Zelle over to Agatha. She's going to talk in a bit more about her own experiences. I'm just going to... Um, and then we're both have, very happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I was just going to say before we hand over to Agatha that um, yeah. this webinar is a safe space to ask any questions. There are no stupid questions. Don't feel embarrassed for not knowing something. That is the reason we are doing this. And I'm sure uh, the speakers will agree with that. So please, any questions that you have, no matter if you think oh, this is probably something I should know, it's fine, ask away. So we're going to hand over to Agatha now, who's going to share a bit about her story. Just getting off mute. Oh yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, we've got you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just a comment first, there's no stupid questions. Actually, we love questions because we know people are listening and understanding and they want to know the details of, um, of AIDS, HIV and AIDS. So don't, don't be shy to ask or don't feel like, ah, oh, it's a silly one, no, nothing silly. So my name is Agatha, I'm a positive speaker for George House Trust, uh, which means we go around like we are doing now uh, in schools, in um, public places, community groups to, talk, uh, to teach people about HIV and share our stories. And also, I'm a peer mentor, which means uh, we go, we we get in touch with the newly uh, diagnosed, just to give them hope, encourage them, and to let them know that they're like us. Uh, they're just at the beginning of the journey, and then they'll catch up later, and they'll be fine. So uh, my story, I share my story because obviously we want to teach people about HIV. But also we want people to understand that HIV is not only, you cannot only catch it through sleeping around. A lot of people uh, catch it in so many ways. So that's the reason we share our story so people can understand and also the, to end stigma and discrimination towards people living with HIV. So my story goes back to Africa. I, I originally came from Malawi. I lost my parents when I was young and I went to live with my uncle, who is my mother's brother. So my uncle, when I turned 12, uh, he started sexually abusing me. And uh, the first time I said, if I dare tell anyone, he's going to strangle me, burn my body and nobody's gonna find out where I was. So I was young and scared, so I didn't tell anyone. So it kept on happening because I was living in the same house with him. It kept on happening. So when I was 15, I thought, no, uh, enough now. I'm going to tell someone. Of course, I knew that I wouldn't be believed or because of everything that I had heard around, the experiences, other people's experiences. So I thought, OK, even though they're not going to believe me, but this is it, I'm going to tell them. So I told my auntie, my mother's younger sister, and definitely she didn't believe me. So uh, she called a meeting, a family meeting, everyone came and she asked me to apologize to my rapist right in front of him. And I knelt down and apologized. So that was like the beginning of me uh, having discussions with myself. The first thing I thought of was, no, I'm not going back to his house after all this. So it says I'm just gonna kill myself or I just have to disappear. But where I was going to, I didn't know because this was my family. This is everything I had known. 
So in the middle of the night, I just thought, no, I'm leaving. So I just left. I ended up uh, in the bus station, uh, which is the capital city of Malawi, Lilongwe. And I ended up being homeless. I was a street child. I don't know if you've been to Africa, but there are a lot of street, child, street children in the streets. So I was one of them for a few days. And then the third day, there was a couple that was coming from uh, another, another place to where I was living. So they wanted directions to the Ministry of Education. So the only person who could speak English because it was, um, a, mix, it was um, a mixed couple. It was a white guy and a mixed woman. So they were speaking English. So obviously I had been to school and I'm in the streets. So I was able to, to give them directions in English. So that's when now I got their attention, like, what are you doing in the streets? So um, I told them a little bit of my story and then they said, okay, come with us. We we'll sit down later on and find out more. So we sat down and I told them everything that I had been through. Luckily, they owned an orphanage. So they said, okay, you can come with us if you like, or we can go to your family and say goodbyes. I was like, no, I don't want anyone to know where I was because I just wanted to start a new life with you know, new people, new experiences. So they took me to the orphanage and um, there I was an inspiration as well because it was typical in the village. So the villages here in, in Africa are different. Here when you say you're in the village, you're posh, uh, you go money, you're loaded, uh, you go farms, but in Africa it means you're the poorest. So uh, there there wasn't so much of inspirations because um, when people reach the age of 14, 15, they're already pregnant, they've already started looking for a husband for the child or they've already started looking for a wife. So there wasn't much of an inspiration. So when I came in, I decided to change the game. So we started doing uh, acting clubs, writing clubs in the orphanage. So a lot of children after school, they would come and uh, do the, the writing competitions. Their stories would be posted on the board and the, the, that, that was the routine. Now I graduated, uh, eventually, we, we had the journalists who came to the orphanage to look uh, at what we do. And I was introduced to them like, oh, look at our right. I'm sorry, I had a phone call there. So, um, and then, oh yeah. And then the journalists were like, okay, uh, she needs to go to a journalism school because whatever she's doing right now, whatever she's writing is good, but she's got no knowledge what it is. So eventually I was sent to a journalism school and I graduated to be a journalist. Now, every time I was, I was leaving, I was living there, I was on and off sick. Uh, but then um, I had thought of maybe I could be HIV positive, but I was young and I didn't want to know that I was HIV positive, I was scared. But also I didn't know that the more I am avoiding to go and get tested, my immunity, I'm not helping it, it's suppressed. So my healthy is not, I, I'm putting my, my own life in danger. So uh, I graduated and then I moved from the orphanage and um, I worked a little bit as a Malawi Electoral Commission reporter. And then I auditioned for a play. Uh, you, you, you know Madonna, the celebrity, the singer, she adopted children in Malawi. So we had some Scottish directors who came to Malawi to look for actors to come and perform at Edinburgh Festival, the story about Madonna's adoption. So um, in Malawi, acting is not a career, it's just a hobby you do. So when I heard of that, I uh, went to do auditions and I got selected. I came to England, I came to Scotland. So when I stayed here, I saw life was different because even the directors, they, had, they knew the life I was living in in Malawi, it wasn't that of safe. So I told them, no, I'm not going back. I'm staying here and I'm changing my story. So they're like, okay, uh, about your immigration and everything, you'll be fine. As long as you're in the good books with the home office, you'll be fine. So I went to live with a friend in Bradford and um, I was unwell, really, really unwell. So we went to register the GP. That's when I found out I was HIV positive. And they referred me to the local HIV clinic and I started my medication straight away. So now these days when you are HIV positive, uh, they start your medication straight away. Back in the day, they wouldn't start medication straight away. They would wait until your CD4 count is really 
low, that's when they'll start you. But mine was very, very low because I had stayed with the virus for a long time. So my diagnosis was in 2009, but I believe I had for a long time over, over 2000, below 2009. So I could have stayed with it for a long time since I was 12 years old. Now I started taking my medication straight away and I also had some um, lumps on my, on my neck, which were giving me fever, chills, feeling unwell all the time. So they took the, they had a biopsy and they found out I had TB. So TB treatment, you take loads and loads of tablets every day. Uh, and I was living with people that don't know about my status, people that I had known ages ago when I was in Malawi. So I couldn't just open up knowing how sick my HIV is. So I just kept it to myself. Eventually they found out and they chased me out of the house, leave our house. And I left, I started looking for people to live with on Facebook. Luckily one of the church members took me into their house and they got communicated as well from the other family. And this new family took me out of the house again. Then I moved to London to uh, one family as well. There, after staying for some time, they had children and it was all good comments. You're the best person we've ever had. You're amazing, your personality, everything. But when they found out I was taking HIV medication, it became an issue. Leave our house, we don't wanna see you anymore. You, you, you had to hide this, you could have infected our children. So there wasn't, time for me to educate them about HIV because you, you don't sit down with an angry person and start convincing them that I am safe when they are obviously think you are in danger, they are in danger. So I left and that's when I came to Manchester. In Manchester, I was introduced to George House Trust through my uh, HIV clinic and I have been with George House Trust since then. Now, uh, I had undergone through counseling, I had undergone through uh, trainings uh, to know much about myself, to know much about my HIV. So towards the end of uh, last year, I decided uh, all my life with the experiences that I've told you about, I wanted to help people that basically it was uh, people that have been raped. I wanted to find uh, peace or to, to find myself through helping other people. But then as well, I, was, I thought, okay, it's not just rape that I've been through. I'm also HIV positive. And this is a stigma topic. It's a taboo topic in our communities. What if I also make a difference in that area? So I went back to George House Trust and asked them, I want to be a peer mentor. I want to help people living with HIV newly diagnosed. I was trained and then I was like, uh, I need something a bit more challenging maybe. So uh, I, I went to Paul, Paul trained me as a positive speaker. Now I go around in the communities with Paul and uh, teaching people about HIV. Since I've been diagnosed, I've been honest with you, I've never lied down saying, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm unwell because of HIV, no. I've always taken my medication, I've always been fit. I've, I've got a daughter, she's six years old. Uh, she's safe, she doesn't have it. My ex-partner doesn't have it. And now I've got a new man, uh, he's, he's negative and he's okay with it because he understand and unde detectable is equal to untransmittable. So we are all safe. Now, um, with all ex the experiences I've been through at George House Trust, uh, the knowledge I gained, uh, the experiences of stigma, I decided to set up um, a community uh, group for African women living with HIV, just to support each other, to give each other hope and just to stand up and say, okay, we are against the HIV stigma and we are moving together. Like this year, 2022, the HIV World AIDS, World AIDS Day topic is uh, equalized. So it's just us to stand up together and asking the community, the groups, the world to stand up together and equalize. Um, up to 2022, there are some countries, those of us living with HIV, we cannot go to. And there are also some laws. Some people living with HIV cannot insure their homes just because they're living with HIV. So these are the things where like, no, we are the same. There's you equals you. Undetectable is equal to untransmittable. Why can't we live equally? So 
Yeah, uh, there was also a question I saw about uh, HIV, what is HIV and what is AIDS? Mm -hmm. So like you had previously said, HIV is a virus that causes AIDS. So um, I've got a woman at the moment I'm looking after, she's at Manchester North Manchester Hospital. She just came in from Africa. Uh, she didn't know she was HIV positive until she started feeling unwell with our beautiful weather, just to everything out. And she found out she's, uh, she's HIV positive. I went to see her and uh, I asked the doctors, what is her CD4 count? And they said it was nine. So that, that like the way she is, uh, she's got rashes all over her face, her body. So that's, those are the symptoms Paul was talking about. When HIV is moving to AIDS, you start experiencing so many different types of illnesses. So um, HIV and AIDS are different. There was also a, a, a question about uh, how do we, like language wise, yeah, um, I think if we get on to the questions in a second, thank you so much for sharing your story, Agatha. It's really nice to be mm. able to hear from someone so open about what they've been through. So thank you so much for sharing. And um, yeah, we have got some questions that we're going to talk about, about, um, about HIV and also about how in your salon you can ensure that you are being inclusive and open to those who are living in HIV and not discriminating against them, because you may be doing that without even realising. So um, we're going to start with um, what are the main like common misconceptions within the beauty industry when it comes to treating a client with HIV? And I think we'll pass over to Sam for this one. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Um, the the thing that, that I see, first of all, is, is on the consultation forms, people are asking the question. And um, it can be debatable whether this should or shouldn't be asked for certain things, but definitely for a massage, for example, it, there's no reason whatsoever to ask that question. But then also what people are doing is they're linking, they're putting AIDS on there as well. And people in the UK generally don't really have AIDS and they wouldn't be trotting out for a treatment. They'd be incredibly poorly in hospital, um, probably dying of something like pneumonia. You know, they, they just wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't get someone taking yes to that. So it's very, very dated. And this is what I'm seeing is there's a massive lack of education. Um, there's several brands that I've approached because I've seen it on their form, I've educated them and they've removed it. You know, it was that easy. But there are still, um, I think people inherit consultation questions because um, it isn't on the National Occupational Standards, which we've just reviewed in beauty. There is nothing on there saying that we need to ask someone's status. There's nothing saying on there we can refuse treatment. So it's, it's these hand-me-down consultation questions that I'm seeing a lot. And this is happening in brand new, there's a brand new spa in Manchester. They have it on their form. That's not okay. Yeah. And um, what treatments are, uh, is it relevant to know HIV status for, if any? Okay. So the, the, the things I hear back are, oh, I need to know if someone's on medication because it's because it could affect the treatment. It could make their skin more sensitive. It could make pigment change and eyebrow tattooing. And yes, that might be the case, but lots of medications can do that. So unless you're a pharmacist, how on earth are you gonna know what that medication does? And I think mm -hmm. asking someone's HIV status to then find out their medication, to then ask them for a doctor's note for a treatment when it's completely not necessary, it, it, it's just insanity really. Um, so some, a myth that, that I think really needs clearing up as well, I hear is people living with HIV heal slower. No, they heal, they heal at the same rate. I'm right, aren't I, Paul? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, my, my, my CD4 count, which is how strong the immune system is, was 900 last time, which is well within the ordinary range. My health is completely fine. My life expectancy is normal. In fact, there's been some research to show that the people living with HIV I expect it is higher than people who don't have HIV because we have regular checkups and we get things monitored. So a friend of mine, they caught an early form of cancer because they had regular treatments, but our life expectancy is fine. And it's also illegal against the law. Um, the quality legislation says very clearly, if you're living with HIV, like me and Agatha, you're completely fine. You still can't sack us, you can't in us work, because that's against the law, and you can't in us services. But we're having increase and we've had quite a few people coming to George House just saying they tried to get a tattoo or some beauty treatments and they've been denied. And actually, 
it's completely unnecessary. You know, HIV is a really difficult virus to catch. Even if you're really infectious, there's no way you're going to affect anybody through any form of beauty treatment. It's a really hard virus to catch. And people, a lot of people have information from the 80s and 90s, really. So it's really important yeah. that we get this message across about U equals U to people. Yeah, yeah because if we're asking the question, the answer can only be yes or no, can't it? Or I don't know. So if some, so if I said to Paul, are you in the correct terminology is living with HIV, not are you infected or have you got HIV? Yeah. And Paul says yeah. yes. Oh, but Paul's not contagious. So why would that stop me doing a treatment? It's just it's mm -hmm. having the question on there. It, it it could be worded. Have you got any current um, contagious blood disorders? I mean, who know who. There's probably two of us on here that know we don't and two of us on here that we know we might not. Do you know what I mean? Like, we don't know the answers to this. Um, and it's very rare someone comes for a beauty treatment that has something that ticks yes anyway. Yeah, very true. And um, I think people being refused treatments based off living with HIV when they shouldn't be refused it can also have a massive effect on their mental health and their self-worth and self-value so how does that affect people living with HIV when they get turned away for something that really they're welcome to have and should be able to have the treatment mm -hmm. yeah cool I think for me it's a stigma and the self-stigma and Agatha touch on you know you know what happened to her people found out she was living with HIV they asked her to leave the house. You know, people um, are incredibly ignorant and to prejudice. People make assumptions, particularly if you're a woman, they make assumptions about how you contracted HIV. So it's challenging that stigma with correct information, mm -hmm. but also making sure that people living with HIV aren't self-stigmatizing. And I know when I went to see my dentist, for example, he said he asked me to always make an appointment at the end of the day, and that was completely unnecessary. And actually, for me, that's really you know, it reinforces that I'm, there's something wrong with me, that I'm dangerous. I'm absolutely clear. People scared about HIV. I'm the safest person you can meet because I'm undetectable. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, just to comment on that, I think we say yeah. stigma. I think this is a posh way of saying hate because that's the original way that we can happily use, like, it's hate. Now, how does it feel if somebody shows you right in the face that I hate you? and leave and I don't want to be with you if you have this condition. And the worst part is, it's not a kind of a condition that you can just take it out of your body. It's something that's stuck in your DNA and it's never going to go away. Now that gives you, not only does it give you, uh, uh, it also gives you insecurities. Wherever you go, you feel like, are they going to ask? Even if they don't ask, uh, am I okay to be here? You know, am I okay to do this? Now you find yourself being limited. I work with, uh, like I've said, I'm now supporting Afri uh, African women living with HIV. Most of them, because of the stigma they experienced in the past, it doesn't matter what kind of, whether they went to a beauty salon, whether they went to uh, the shops, whether they were living in a house and they experienced stigma, it gives them so much insecurities to a point that they didn't want to go to work anymore. They were scared to find a job because they're living with HIV. I had to educate them, I had to sit down with them, and I had to support, to help them to look for jobs. And now they're working with the NHS. And there were some, they couldn't go to school. Or they don't speak English, but they were scared to just go for an English lesson because they think, oh, they will know about my status. No, you don't need to tell anyone about your status. You're undetectable. Somebody standing in front of you teaching you English, you cannot transmit to them. So I had to go through that because of the experience that I've lived in. The, the courage that I've got and also the empowerment that I got from George Charles Trust. I decided to use that to another woman. Now they are in schools now, they're studying English and they're doing really well, but it's the stigma that stopped them. It's the hate that stopped them. So yeah. it doesn't really affect the mental health because you start now living an isolated life. You don't want to be around anyone. You want to, stay, you, you want to do, what, what did we call it? You want to do uh, lockdown? You just want to stay inside the house without anyone associating with anyone. So it does bring an impact a lot. I had um, a friend of mine reach out to me uh, a couple of weeks ago. He went to a brand new spa in Manchester for a treatment and, and he is living with HIV. Um, he, he's not out, you know, which is a shame as well because 
you know, so many people are scared to tell anyone about their status. Um, and he, the question was on there. He sent me a photo of it and he was like, why is this on there? Like, and he said it really upset him. He didn't enjoy, enjoy them. He was having a massage, you know, he didn't enjoy the treatment. He felt really anxious all through it. And it really upset him that people are still asking that question on forms like that. Mm. And um, I know we touched on it briefly, but I was just going to ask a bit more about what language should be used when discussing living with HIV and what should be avoided. I know George House Trust has a language guide, but if we could just um, touch on that quickly. Oh, have we got Paul? Well, we say living, I'll start and see if Paul comes in. Uh, we say living with HIV, we yeah. don't say, we don't say, uh, infected with or we don't really say HIV positive do we we'd say more living with HIV mm -hmm. um and we and we wouldn't say um contracted I don't think Paul can you help no, me I, th I think we'd say and, yeah I think in these days it was very much about living with HIV um we tend to talk now about late HIV diagnosis rather than AIDS AIDS is really rare in this country very few people have AIDS and die of AIDS and we tend to talk about, um, we don't tend to say disclose, or we used to say disclose living with HIV, and you disclose like a criminal conviction. So it's just trying making sure that the language is sort of neutral or positive. So actually, and we certainly, you know, people in the past get really confused about the difference between HIV and AIDS. I'm HIV positive, I've been HIV positive 20 years. I've never had a diagnosis of AIDS. If I stop taking the medication I'm on, over time, the virus will grow back in my body and I would eventually become ill and get a whole series of, you know, people go blind, people get dementia, people waste away, people get a rare form of cancer. There's lots of diseases that you can die of. And that's, that's a, age is a syndrome of potential diseases. But in this country, it's really rare. The majority of people living with HIV are undetectable. If people ask me now, I tend to say I'm undetectable rather than living with HIV. I'm actually undetectable because I'm sort of living with HIV. But my, And for me, my identity is someone who's undetectable, really, rather than actually living with HIV. Mm. And so would you say sharing their status rather than disclosing then, if we're talking about the language? Yes, yes. Or just talk, revealing or sort of sharing. But like the disclosures have quite negative connotations, I think. Yeah. Now. I think it's about looking mm. at the words being used and ensuring that then they don't have negative connotations. If you were using them in any other context, then they were negative. Why are you using them in this context? And I think it's good to self-reflect on that when doing consultation forms or anything like that, or even just discussing it and talking to someone about it. Yeah. Um, on the, if I can just add on the consultation forms, I think, well, asking have you got HIV or AIDS definitely needs to disappear. But... Yeah. If, if someone was doing, say, microneedling, for example, they could they could say, um, have you got any current, you know, are you fit and healthy at the moment would probably be the question I would ask somebody, because then I would work out then if they can heal properly. Um, mm -hmm. There could be so many factors. Thank you. And, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. For me, it's the, have you got AIDS? Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, it just freaks me out. I don't know what to say, because, I don't have AIDS, I've never had AIDS. So when it, when it goes to, have you got AIDS? That brings me to 1980. And I'm like, okay, I'm in 2022 now. Um, I'm HIV positive and uh, I cannot transmit it, you know? So it's, have you got AIDS? And also the forms that I see of, uh, I've got HIV and AIDS. I find it hard to feel it because I don't have AIDS, I have HIV. So it's really that kind of communication. Yeah, understanding that they are whilst related to separate diseases and having AIDS, having HIV doesn't automatically mean you have AIDS as well. Um, so where can people um, learn more about, you know, communicating with people living with HIV and how to support them in their salon? What, what are the best um, places to look for guidance? Would they go to the George House Trust website, Paul, for that? For education? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's, uh, yeah, there's information at George House website. We often talk about the National AIDS Manual, which is lots of great information. We're very happy we've run positive training speaker sessions to all sorts of different groups. We, we've spoken a couple of times at the National uh, Tattooist Conference in Manchester because there were issues with tattooists 
you know, refusing people to get tattoos. So I think we're quite happy to talk to people. There's a lot of information out there online, really, but it's just making sure that people have the chance to do that. But I think from my point of view, talking to someone living with HIV, the lived experience, the patient experience, is a really powerful way of getting the message across. So that's why we're really keen to run sessions like this. The work we do in schools is really important. Actually, we talk to hundreds of young people in schools in Manchester. So I think that gives the, the next generation a chance to find out about HIV and also to, to talk about people living in schools, really. Yeah, um, and we are working on, um, it's not out yet because <laughs> World AIDS Day got in the, in the way this year, but we're working on a guide on HIV for the beauty industry. Um, so I'm working on that with George House Trust and that will get released next year and then we will be able to put that out to everybody. It will be free to download um, and hopefully there'll be some training. We're working on some training actually to go out that people can do um, for a small donation um, so that so that they can they can kind of get a little bit of a certificate, get get educated with it formally um, and also raise funds for George House Trust. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I was also going to finish off with asking where people can go to donate. So would that be the George House Trust website again? Or? Yeah, absolutely. I think we can probably drop a link in the comments. Yeah. Um, but it is, you know, even if it's one or two pounds, I know times are hard at the moment, but it is a really, really important cause and the work they do is is phenomenal. Um, it really is. Um, just quickly as well, the when we mentioned the tattooists, what they actually did, and this puts everything a little bit in perspective, is George House Trust got the council to write to every single tattoo parlour across the whole of Greater Manchester, reminding them not to refuse treatment for someone living with HIV. Amazing. Do that for a tattoo. I think we can do that for an eyebrow shape, can't we? <laughs> Definitely. Thank you so much, all of you, for your time. Agatha, thank you so much for sharing your story and you as well, Paul, and giving us a bit more um, insight into George House Trust. And Sam, thank you as always for taking part in another webinar with us and for your wisdom from the beauty side of everything. And yeah, we'll definitely uh, drop the website link for George House Trust in the comments. And I'm sure if you get in touch with them directly, they'll be more than happy to help you with any further questions or queries you may have. So thank you all so much for joining us on this webinar. It will stay up on our Facebook and also be posted to Instagram. So if you ever wanna come back and just have a little refresher about what we spoke about today, it will be there for you. Thank you very much, guys. Have a lovely day. Thanks so much. Thank well, you.